I'm of that generation that did this kind of thing in the 60s and the 70s when you demonstrated against another war that was as immoral as this one. And it will take these kinds of conferences and these kinds of, of, <clears throat> of gatherings to eventually send this message out to the politicians of this country and of this, of this world that this war is not only immoral, this war is an abomination, and this war is aimed at the working classes of this country as well as every other country in the world. It's aimed at the working classes, which you all understand, because those are the sons and daughters who die in these things. This war is obviously over oil. It's obviously over profits for the Halliburton, the Halliburtons of the world. And we're the people <clears throat> who pay the price, ultimately. When I talked to Brother Heyman about <coughs> the, the organization of this conference, of which my local, which is at the other end of the Embarcadero, has contributed a sum of money to support the thing, I started to think about what needed to be said here. And I came across some words that were written 50 years ago or more by a man who had suffered at the hands of the German Nazis in World War II. His name was Pastor Martin Niemöller. And although he had been a supporter of the Nazi party at the very beginning, he changed his position at some point and he ended up in the Dachau concentration camp, and somehow or another he survived all that. After the war, he wrote these words, and I wish to read them to you because I think, I think it represents exactly what we're doing here today and the message that needs to be sent and will, will impart to us the importance of our participation in these kinds of events. Martin Niemöller said, first, they came for the communists and I did not speak out because I was not a communist. Then they came for the socialists and I did not speak out because I was not a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionists and I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews, and I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. Then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak out for me. What we are doing here today, in a collective fashion, we are speaking out. Each one of us, when we leave here today, needs to continue to speak out, not only against this war, which is why we're here today, but we need to speak out against every social injustice that we see. Because if we do not speak out, no one else will. And at some point, just as Pastor Niemöller said, there will be no one left to say the words that need to be said to change the policies of the governments that we're all forced to live under. There's something happening right now with this tremendous repression that's coming down from the White House. And it's not just the Bush administration because the Democratic Party is part and parcel of this war on terror. Most recently, there's been an article in Harper's Magazine, of all periodicals, that liberal magazine, calling for a general strike. The general strikes 
are not something to be taken lightly. You can't just throw the word out, general strike. We in the trade union movement know it's got to be organized from the bottom up, that workers have to feel the need to shut down at the point of production in order to advance their gains, whether it's for a universal medical care or against an imperialist war. The workers are the ones that have the power to do it, and they have to understand that. Daniel Ellsberg or someone else has been talking about a general strike. But the reality is, if there's going to be strike actions against the war, it's going to come from the workers themselves. We've had an interesting last few months here in the port of San Francisco that I think tests where our members are. It's a good measure of where longshore workers are right now. We had a brother who was killed in an industrial accident on the ship. Something unusual happened in response to that because we work in a very dangerous industry. The port was shut down for 24 hours. Longshoremen walked off the ship in protest. For 24 hours, this port was shut down. Because it struck a responsive chord amongst our members. And I'm not talking fairy tales where longshoremen just automatically went down the gangway and threw down their tools and, and walked off the docks. It was people like Melvin McKay, the rank and file leaders in this union, that told them it's time to put your tools down and to honor the brother and get off the ship for safety. If it could happen to Reggie Ross, it could happen to any of us. Another thing happened recently in this port. Well, actually in the port of Sacramento under the guise of Homeland Security, under the rubric of the War on Terror, which we've been saying for a long time, the War on Terror is directed not against terrorists, but against workers. That's what our banner up there says. Bush's War on Terror is a war on workers. And it came true, unfortunately, in the port of Sacramento when two black longshoremen were returning to work after lunch. They simply asked the port security why, what authority, by what authority they have to inspect their trunk and glove compartment. And then they called the business agent. And that triggered off the guards who were outraged and called the local police and came in. The cops came in like a SWAT team, surrounded the car, dragged the brothers out, maced one of them, handcuffed them, made him get down on his knees. This was images that were apparent around the time of apartheid South Africa. It's not something that should be happening in this country, but it is because of the war on terror and the climate that it's created in this country. Now these protests that I talk about aren't protests that come down from the international. The trade union bureaucracy in this country has become part and parcel of the system. They're working with the employers to make sure that port security is implemented. Even though port security targets in such vicious ways as what happened in Sacramento, it targets longshore workers and port workers, the trade union bureaucracy across the board in every union in this country is going along with this, and it's a scandal. These rallies and picket lines are organized by rank and file workers against the will and wishes of the trade union bureaucracy. That's where the strength and power of the labor movement is. And it's easy for people to get up on Labor Day or even on May Day or on Bloody Thursday and say, we need unity in the labor movement. But the fact of the matter is, when labor leaders are selling out, when they're betraying, when they're collaborating with the bosses, we need to do what was done here in 1934. 
because before you can have unity, you've got to have leadership that's willing to fight the bosses. This port here rose up against the leadership in New York, the corrupt leadership that was in bed with the employers. It was a rank-and-file revolt led by militants, and it struck a responsive chord up and down the coast, so that we ended up having a general strike, the whole West Coast was shut down, and we won things like this hiring hall. It was won by a coast-wide strike where every port was shut down because workers refused to go to work until we got a hiring hall. That's the kind of struggle we need today. When trade union leaders are selling out, then it's up to the rank and file to get that class struggle back online. And there is a crying need to oppose this war in Iraq and Afghanistan. It benefits no one in the working class. The war profiteers benefit from it, yes. But they're the bosses. They're on the other side. We need to understand that the money that's being used to fight the war in Afghanistan and Iraq, and will probably be extended to Iran and maybe Syria, is money that should be spent at home for schools, for health care, for things that working people in this country need and are deprived of. It's uh, a pleasure being here today on the, for the National Union of Rail, Maritime and Transport Workers. Our union is uh, 17 years old. It comes together as an amalgamation of the National Union of Seafarers and the National Union of Railway Workers. We only thought that railway workers and seafarers working together in the ports should come together as an industrial union. We've been around for over 125 years. Uh, we are an industrial union, very similar to the International Longshore and Warehouse Workers Union. It was a pleasure being over here last year with three of our EC members, and it's a pleasure being here today with our Executive Committee members, Peter Gale, Dave Nelson, Dave Gott, and our retired President, Tony Donaghy, and of course, the previous speaker, John Leach. Now, the question that we've got to ask ourselves is that why is there still a war going on in Iraq and why there's still a war going on in Afghanistan, which seems to be forgotten. And if we ain't very careful as a movement, then there'd be another war taking place, where it be maybe in Iran, where it be in North Korea, or where it be in Cuba, or any axis of evil, which this government and our government says there's an axis of evil, and we will forget about the Iraq war like people are forgetting about the Afghanistan war. Now we have to understand what this war is all about. It's easy to turn around and say it's simply about oil, but we have to go beyond that. You know, sometimes you have to have wars. The 39 to 45 war, for example, in my view, is a just war. It fought out fascism. And if fascism wasn't fought, then there could have been a total different scenario taking place on the globe all today. In 1936, volunteers from around the world went out to Spain and fought fascism against Franco in Spain, against a democratically elected government to fight against that republic that took place. In my view, that was a just war. But the war that is taking place, very similar to the 1914-18 war, and the war that's taking place in Iraq has got no justification about the advancement of human mankind, but about the advancement of what is called imperialism. Now, imperialism is pretty simple. Imperialism means that because that you're a human being in one nation, that you can exert your influence on another worker purely on the basis that you're more advanced to rape and obtain the materials and riches that country's got. And the fact of the matter is, is that imperialism is all about making money for a minority of people. You see, if you look around what's happened around the world, there was an invasion of a little country called Cyprus in 1974 by Turkey. And they invaded that country, and no one given monkeys about the invasion of 
Turk of Cyprus on the basis that Cyprus never had no oil. In South Africa, there was an apartheid system that existed for decades out there, purely on the basis that if you was a different coloured skin, you never had the right to go to a school, you never had the right to go to a restaurant, you never had the right to a decent house, and for years, if people sat back and allowed that to happen, because they could not see there was an advancement for big business in those issues. Now we have to say to ourselves, why was it that in the United Kingdom, two million people marched on the streets against the war, and the war was still carried out? We have to say, why did the troops go into Iraq? Now this may sound controversial, but the reality is, I don't think the American troops or the British troops will go into North Korea. And the reason why they won't go into North Korea is that the North Korean people have nuclear weapons. Now, I don't believe the North Korean people should have nuclear weapons. But I also believe that the American people and the British people and the Israeli people and no one should have nuclear weapons throughout the world and we should live in a nuclear-free world for everyone. Take, for example, <coughs> this morning. You've now got combined forces of nearly 200,000 war, 200,000 troops in Iraq, when you combine all the countries around the world. You've got something in a region of 50,000 civil servants, and you've got something in a region of 15,000 clerical staff. Nearly 300,000 people are now in Iraq when we're told that in parts of America, like Georgia and Atlanta, there's only 90 days of water left. We see massive flooding taking place in New Orleans. We see droughts in parts of Africa. I'll tell you what, those troops should not be going around killing other mankind in Iraq. They should be in places like Africa, Georgia, Atlanta and New Orleans, delivering for the people proper human subsidies. That's where those people should be. <coughs> but the reason why they won't attack North Korea because they've got those nuclear weapons. Now we have to argue ourselves as a trade union movement. Well, some people in the trade union movement say, well, what are we getting involved in politics for? Well, the reality is, is that trade unions are essential for working days and working nights when you're at workplace. It's essential that a trade union gets you a safe place at work. It's essential that the trade union gets you good pay, good conditions, good pensions. But we're beyond just the workplace. We should be raising the banner a bit more. Because, you see, if we want that great world out there of decent pay, decent conditions, and security for our children and grandchildren, then none of it can be obtained if there's a nuclear war. And none of it can be obtained if those people that go to war come back in body bags. And I'm not attacking any person who goes to the Iraq war in a suit made of army material. As far as I'm concerned, they're decent human beings that are doing a job. But the best way to protect our young sons and young daughters from not being killed in the Iraq war is to get all of those troops out and bring them back home and let the Iraqi people decide their own destiny. Because the fact is this, I don't want anyone saying to me about I'm a Saddam Hussein sympathiser. I've, I've got to be absolutely clear with you. I wouldn't urinate on Saddam Hussein when he was alive, to be honest with you, and I couldn't care less about their regime. In 1980, my trade union wrote to the government of the day, Margaret Thatcher, and complained about the Saddam Hussein regime because they were torturing trade unionists and they were torturing people that was in the Communist Party in 1980. Of course, it was a different matter then. Saddam Hussein was a friend, and a friend of the British government and a friend of the American government. And then Frankenstein monster turned on Frankenstein what Saddam Hussein turned on the Bush and the Blair government. And the fact of the matter is, I'm no friend of any kind of terrorism. My view that people win over debates by peaceful persuasion. But the reality is this, is that all of the oil and all of the billions of pounds that's been extracted from Iraq 
and from other parts of the Arab world hasn't led to Arab human beings, working people, increasing their living standards. And you can understand the way they feel that all of these countries around the world that have been built on oil, and all of these countries that a minority of people have made millions out of oil, then you can understand why terrorism takes place on the basis that they see that they've been totally neglected. Because Arabs lived in tents a hundred years ago, they shouldn't be living in tents in 2007, but they should be reaping the benefits of the minerals that are underneath them and the other people around the world that reap the benefits instead of them. So therefore, brothers and sisters, I think today's meeting is a crucial meeting. We need to widen up the issue about how we're going to stop this war, how we're going to bring our young troops home from Iraq, how we're going to stop the Afghanistan war, and how we're going to build a new peace movement throughout the world. One that's built on simple issues. A decent job, decent pay, a decent place at work that when you go to work you're safe, decent medical care, looking after our pensioners, making sure the world lives in peace. All of those issues can only be achieved that we don't go around spending billions of pounds in destructing society, but we should be spending billions of pounds on constructing society for human beings. All the very best. I represent, as the president of the Oakland Education Association, nearly 3,000 teachers, school nurses, psychologists, school counselors, speech therapists, and su substitute teachers. And we are under the gun. I wanted to start with the costs of war, just to link what's happening in this country with what's happening to education. I don't know how many of you follow the Cost of War website. If you haven't looked at it, you need to. Just Google Cost of War. As of this morning, it gives a running total of the dollars being spent on the war. As of this morning, it's nearly $462 billion. In the Bay Area, it's $15 billion. With that money, we could have hired 275,148 additional teachers for one year, or paid for 2 million children to attend one year of Head Start, or insured more than 9.5 million children for one year. That's in the Bay Area. In Oakland, where I come from, a city of 400,000 people, the cost of war so far is $582 million. We could have hired over 10,000 additional teachers for a year, or paid for over 77,000 children to attend Head Start, or insured nearly 350,000 children for a year. This is insanity, and this is criminal. I want to take you back for a moment to your own childhoods. And I'd like you to think about when you went to school. How many of you had a library with a librarian in it? How many had a school nurse, maybe with a little white cap perched on her head? How many of you had a counselor in high school? How many of you remember kindergarten where you went to play with your friends and learn how to share? It's all changed. If you haven't stepped into a classroom, especially in an urban environment in the last five or six years, you wouldn't recognize what you see. There is nothing in common with what's happening now and your childhoods, unless maybe you go to a suburban school or to a wealthier district, but even those are changing. Welcome to the Business Roundtable, the corporate version of so-called educational reform. Under No Child Left Behind, which in reality is leaving untold millions of children behind every day, especially poor and minority children, this is what we have. We have high stakes testing. And far from closing the achievement gap, it's actually widening it as the divisions within society are wider and wider between the rich and poor, between black and white, between Latinos and others. High stakes testing means that test scores mean everything. Children are reduced to test scores. Teachers are reduced to teachers of testing. They're pushed to teach to the test, and why is that? So they avoid the sanctions under No Child Left Behind, because 
You see, if your, school, if your school doesn't score high enough on all the different standards that they have put forward, then you can be either shut down, turned into a charter, or reconstituted. That means that every teacher has to reapply for their job, and the veteran teachers are usually sent packing. We have an increasingly scripted curricula. I thought Dick and Jane, when I was seven or eight, was pretty scripted, but it was, it was literature compared to what they have now. You have pacing guides that tell you what day you should be on what page and what your neighbor should be teaching at the same time. You have mandates coming from the top down that have nothing to do with academic freedom or teaching. How many of you have heard of bubble kids? Bubble kids are what you have when schools are really frantic to raise those test scores just a little bit higher so that you can achieve your average yearly uh, adequate yearly progress. Bubble kids are those kids that fall in the middle, that might be close to achieving proficiency, but they're not quite there. So teachers are to told to focus on the bubble kids. Leave the kids that are way below, they're never going to get there anyway. And forget about those kids at the top, they'll figure it out on their own. It's leading to a generation of children who are being turned into little robots or being so, becoming so disinterested in school that they're leaving when they get to high school. There are no more libraries in most of the schools. There are no more nurses in most of the schools. There is no more art, music, PE, foreign languages in most of the schools. There's a huge turnover of teachers. Who wants to stay? You enter for a few years and then you leave. There's a huge growth in charter schools. And at the same time, they're closing schools, as Jack just mentioned. We have huge class sizes. I've talked to teachers in the last few weeks who have 28 children in all-day kindergartens without a single aid. In three weeks, in the last three weeks, I've heard from three Oakland schools where raw sewage is bubbling up into the playground and the children can't go outside to play. Custodians have been cut to the point that the schools are filthy. Mice are running through the schools, dropping from the ceilings. Mouse droppings are being found in the places that children play. You can't believe it until you see it. And under the latest revision of No Child Left Behind, sponsored by none other than a Democratic Congressman George Miller and House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, we would reauthorize this abominable law that ties school progress to test scores. We would revise it by tying teacher salaries to those very same test scores, leading to a complete destruction of our public education system. And in short, that's what No Child Left Behind is. It's a destruction by the corporate business roundtable of public education. It's vouchers by the back door, make no mistake. They couldn't get vouchers in a few years ago. This is the way they are doing it. It must be stopped. The war has split the ruling class, not because any sector of that class is against it, but because the voting population has made it clear that they want the US troops out. Global warming demands a solution and has brought forth a new generation of anti-corporate activists. Within months of the Supreme Court essentially outlawing affirmative action and laying the basis for throwing out Brown versus Board of Education completely, and with the wounds in Louisiana and along the coast still bleeding from deliberate government neglect, the atrocity in Gina, Louisiana brought tens of thousands of people into the streets. First time we've seen that in a long time. We're seeing other splits. The California AFL-CIO just came out against Schwarzenegger's health care plan because it's an insurance company health care plan. Now that's no big surprise because AFL-CIO is generally Democrat and Schwarzenegger is Republican. 
but as the Chronicle was quick to point out, Schwarzenegger's plan and Hillary's plan are virtually identical. So we have the possibility of split and the struggle on health care. In education, the U.S. labor bureaucracy, which has been a major prop to this system for decades, embodied in education by the National Education Association and in California by our parent group, the California Teachers Association, has been forced into public opposition to the Democrats over their even worse rewriting of the No Child Left Behind bill. Alan Greenspan, I don't know how many of you picked this up, Alan Greenspan is now publicly worrying that free market trickle-down policies are falling into disrepute in the U.S. because working people are getting fed up with, cannot tolerate the decline in standard of living. When you go to the store and food prices have gone up four or five or six percent, and you go to the doctor if you're lucky enough to have insurance, and your copay has gone from a buck to 15 bucks, everybody in this society is beginning to be squeezed except the super rich. And therein lies the possibility for the greatest crisis in corporate rule since Watergate. Possibility. And it gives us a major opportunity. Now, what about political strikes? If you think back to May 1st of 2006, not very long ago, the massively powerful immigration demonstrations were political strikes. People were asked to stay off work to come to the demonstration. Thousands did. This was not just a demonstration. This was a stay-away strike. In California, that form of strike action had been preceded by the one-day stay-away over the question of driver's licenses for immigrants. This is the largest use of the strike as a political weapon since the 1946 general strike in Oakland or the three-day general strike in the Hawaiian Islands in 1953 when the government was trying to put the head of the ILWU behind bars. So the May Day demonstration suggests that even though we are small right now, with enough organizing, with enough patience, it actually can be done. We are living in a period where it's not just a pipe dream. And the May Day demonstrations also suggest that if local union-led strike actions spark things, the form of a national strike against the war could well be like the immigration rights demonstrations, some cross between people simply coming out to protest, unions, some calling strike action, and workers by the thousands taking the day off and coming to D.C. or whatever to demand an end to the war. 45 million people have no health care. That is immoral in a country like this. It's immoral that people have to join the military to get a college education because college is only affordable for the elite and their children. <clears throat> One of the provisions of the No Child Left Behind Act that Betty didn't talk about is that in the No Child Left Behind Act, schools are mandated to give our children's directory information to recruiters. And if they don't do that, they don't get federal money. The No Child Left Behind Act is just another one of their Orwellian programs because every child gets left behind in that act. 
<laughs> and this is a design. It's a, a design to keep us poor, to keep us working two or three jobs so we can't pay attention to how they're stealing our country and our privileges and our rights. It's designed, college is designed to be expensive so our children will have to go into the military to get their college benefits. The No Child Left Behind Act is just a funnel into the military for our children. And another provision of the No Child Left Behind Act is that George Bush's brother, Neil Bush, you all remember Neil Bush, he writes the test that the children have to pass. And his company makes money off those tests. It is, it's, it's not awful, it's abominable. It's horrible the way they have put their fingers and they're profiting off of our misery is what they are doing. This is only one thing that George Bush needs to be impeached for. And I am running for Congress not only get our troops out of the Middle East immediately and completely, no permanent bases, no, no military or special contractors there, a complete withdrawal from Iraq and Afghanistan, but impeach George Bush and Dick Cheney. Okay, I got one minute. I will be in Congress for two weeks when George Bush and Dick Cheney are still president and vice president. I can promise you that will be the most miserable two weeks of their lives because I will introduce impeachment resolutions every day. I will harangue my fellow members of Congress because if Nancy Pelosi won't hold them accountable, we have to hold her accountable. And I will work to impeach them post office. If they accept any federal assistance, they can be impeached. And somebody finally from America who gets our world into such messes has to be held accountable. I will work with other world leaders like Jeremy and I have a connection with world leaders in my two years campaigning to sanction them and try them in international tribunals for war crimes. Because holding them accountable is the first step in preventing wars of aggression again, preventing people like Casey. An important thing that we have to do though as a peace movement and as human rights movements is support the soldiers who don't want to go over there because they realize it's an illegal and immoral war. Courage to resist, and I'll be speaking at the panel at 1 p.m. We, since there's no opportunities for our children, we have to say, don't go in the military, but we will support you if you don't go. We just can't say, don't join the military and leave them hanging. We just can't say, don't go and not support them. So we have to support them with our money, and with our resources so they can resist this imperial occupation. So with my remaining time, I just want to say I hope that you all join us next week on October 27th for the big anti-war march. I will be there marching with the Cindy for Congress group. And please go to my website, cindyforcongress.org. Come visit us at our, um, at our office. And the world is looking here in the 8th District. The world is looking for hope. And the world is, wants us to prove that organized people always can beat organized money. And we will be victorious. Thank you. In the recent upper house election in July, the government Liber Liberal Democratic Party, LDP, suffered historical defeat. 
and the Abe administration collapsed, collapsed. Outbursts of accumulated anger of the worker people brought this. It held at the beginning of a, uh, end of long years domination of the LDP since 1955. The time of, is ripe for a change. Now is a military militant labor union must appear on the forefront of the coming age. We are holding annually all-out national rally of workers in November in Tokyo with an aim of organizing national nationwide network of fighting labor union, calling upon workers and labor union of every industry branch, branch across the country. It is the tenth rally this year since we started this project. Let's fight together. Because the union movement has to be international. The employers organize globally. The attack on workers' rights through anti-trade union laws, through privatization, through deregulation, through manipulation by moving jobs into low-wage economies is all part of that attack. We don't defeat that attack by isolating ourselves. We defeat that attack by expanding our reach and uniting with the poorest paid and worst off workers in the worst off countries in the world. That is what international labor solidarity is all about. And I think it's a lesson that you've expressed very, very well from the ILWU. We're here to organize and strengthen the cause against the war in Iraq. We're not going to be told in our lifetimes how important the anti-war movement has become. But think back to that great weekend of February the 15th and 16th, 2003. I was in London with Bob Crow and many others, on, uh, and Jack indeed, on February the 15th, 2003, when we had a million people in Hyde Park in the center of London, and there were a further million on the streets outside who couldn't even get into London's largest park to join that rally. There were demonstrations in 600 cities around the world. And because of the Chinese New Year, your demonstration in San Francisco was delayed by one day, and that gave me just enough time to come overnight and join in your demonstration on February the 16th, 2003. That was a worldwide movement against war. It didn't stop the bombing of Iraq, obviously, but I do believe it prevented many other countries from joining in the so-called coalition of the willing to attack Iraq. It has prevented, thus far, an attack on Iran. It has totally isolated Bush and the neocons from their whole project for a new American century, which in reality is corporate aggression against the rest of the world led by Bush and the neocons. It has had that political effect. And just as a generation grew up, remembering their struggle against the Vietnam War, just as an earlier generation grew up remembering their solidarity with Republican Spain against fascism in the 1930s, there's another generation growing up now who remember, and will always remember, the solidarity, the friendship and the fraternity of those marches and demonstrations against the war. We have done a great job of education. But we have to remind people that it's not over. That's the finance of the war, has hit the economies of many countries. Your lack of a decent health service is in part due to the costs of the war. And the loss of US service people in the war is horrific, but the effects on those that have come back is very bad also. I saw on the news last night that apparently 100,000, I'll give you the figure again, 100,000 US service people that have served at some point in Iraq in the past four years are seeking psychiatric help for their mental conditions as a result of what they've done or seen in Iraq. These are also victims of war just as much as those people in Iraq. Add up the figures. More than half a million of civilians are dead in Iraq. Two million Iraqis 
forced into internal exile away from their homes. 1.7 million seeking a place of safety in neighboring countries. And they call this a success? It's a disaster on, grand, on the grandest scale possible for the people of Iraq and for the rest of us. But it is also, and this has been, uh, attention has been drawn to this in earlier contributions, it's also disastrous for the civil liberties of people around the world. You have homeland security, we have anti-terror legislation, there is racial profiling going on, there is um, un uh, inappropriate arrests taking place and detentions taking place. There is the existence of that blot on humanity known as Guantanamo Bay. Uh, and that is all a result of the so-called war on terror. So we have to, I believe, call as quickly as possible, end the lies, end the hypocrisy, end the waste, pull the troops out of Iraq and allow the Iraqi people to decide their own future away from the oil companies, away from the military interests. And don't allow the withdrawal of troops to be replaced by mercenaries working for private security companies that are doing much the same work as the soldiers that are there in the first place. This is the first time I've been in the United States um, as an ind uh, But I've got to say that when I walked into that union meeting last night, it could have been uh, myself walking into my local union branch meeting which is held in the Seven Sisters Road in North London in a club called the Red Rose Club which uh, Jeremy Corbyn over there might be well familiar with and it was it's just exactly the same a feeling of almost deja vu we call it where people were handing out uh, union uh, piece, pieces of paper about cases individuals injustice uh, and I felt a great warmth and a solidarity walking into that room that I will never forget and I will take that feeling back to where I come from, 13,000 miles away, into the union meetings where I represent my members and uh, tell them that uh, if you go to San Francisco, essentially it's exactly the same. They drink coffee, they speak in different accents, but they are exactly the same as you and me. They're trade unionists. These people experience the same struggles that we do, and uh, essentially we are all one. Uh, now today, walking along the... Uh, uh, Dock front as well, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a feeling of like we've been here before. And I know my union was here last year and the General Secretary, uh, who some do say needs a, a, an interpreter who's on next and who's going to speak longer than me, um, uh, will um, we'll share our union's experiences in the anti-war movement perhaps in more detail than I have. But there were two cases that were raised with me last night that I just want to pay some attention to. Two individuals who are uh, suffered in uh, miscarriages of justice at the local police and I know it's a case, there are cases that you're still uh, dealing with yourselves at the moment and I just want to say that touched an accord with me because we too have people uh, that get caught up doing their uh, in their ordinary day-to-day -day work uh, with the uh, forces of law and order and end up where they thought they were actually just doing a job of work they end up becoming the victim sometimes uh, of a racist uh, police officer uh, and I was only sharing with my colleagues last night that we too have had people that are in the same situations and at the end of the day we have to react to that as a union and do whatever it takes to secure justice for those two people and my union sends its fraternal support to that and we wish you well in that and if there's anything we can do you just let us know because where you walk we walk and that's where I want to end my contribution now before Bob comes on uh, and says his piece or two you see because essentially that's what this is all about. Recently in London, we had visitors from another American union come to visit us in our union head office. And I said it to those good comrades, and I say it to yourselves, where you walk, we walk. And in solidarity, I send my union's fraternal greetings to you here today, and thank you very much for allowing me to address you. Thank you. I was just in um, New Orleans yesterday uh, as part of a delegation of the International Labor Communication Association. A couple of hundred labor journalists from around the country went to New Orleans to uh, record, to interview the workers, uh, the community in New Orleans about the situation in New Orleans. And what we discovered is that 60% of the working people of New Orleans area 
between 18 and 44 have no health care. What we discovered was that the teachers' union was busted in New Orleans. They fired all the teachers and opened up charter schools. What we discovered is that the major hospital, public hospital in New Orleans for working people, it's called Charity Hospital, is still closed in New Orleans. It was a WPA project, and that hospital which working people need, in fact, we have a brother here whose son, whose child was born at that hospital, that hospital is still closed, and they want to turn it over to condominium developers. What we discovered is not only was the private, the public hospital closed, but even the veterans hospital in New Orleans is still closed. In fact, I had a taxi cab driver who said that as a veteran, he could not even get health care. And people have to go an hour from their community to go to a hospital. People are dying because of health care. And the issue is, what are working people in this country going to do to stop the billions, hundreds of billions of dollars that are going to war from going to the working people of this country to, for survival, for health care, for jobs? Those are the issues that we face. Racism is in the DNA of our so-called democracy in this country. And any time that this country wages war on people of color in Afghanistan, in Iraq, in other places, deep in the subconscious of American people, creates a chauvinism that allows for apartheid, justice. And that is why we have the Gina Six. That is the reason why eight black, eight members of staff of a juvenile, uh, uh, a juvenile facility in Florida is videotaped, beating, kicking, strangling a black youth and the jury says at the end of the day that they're innocent. Benjamin Crump, the attorney for the family, says, kill a dog, go to jail. Kill a black boy, get away with it. We have to face the fact that one of the major reasons why we cannot end this war in Iraq because we have to be able to overcome the issue of racism in this country. White workers cannot believe that they are part of another working class simply because of white skin privilege, brothers and sisters. And that is one of the reasons why Harry Bridges stood out amongst every, either, every other labor leader in the United States of America around the question of race. He understood fundamentally that discrimination is a tool of the bosses. Every one of us in this room understand what has to be done. We need to take action at the point of production. But make one thing very clear. We have to be able to link the war at home with the war abroad. They go together. You have to understand that police and state repression is directly connected with imperialism abroad, the oppression of people of color. What more do we need to see than what we witness in New Orleans? <laughs> Calling our people refugees and then for the American people to accept it? Saying that people who were going into stores in order to get things for survival that they're looters, talking about how we're going to have uh, members of the National Guard with their weapons trained to shoot to kill in order to distract the American people from the real killers, from the real oppressors. We have to understand this. In order for us to move forward, we are going to have to make those links. Those of us in this room today Many of us are experienced. It's wonderful to see young people. But we have to be able to go back to our respective organizations, in particular our unions, and have some meaningful dialogue around the question of taking action at the point of production. All of this talk doesn't amount to anything if we will not take some kind of action that will call the attention 
of the Republicans and the Democrats, the Bush administration, and the multinational corporations that we in the working class aren't going to take it anymore. If you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything. I'll say it again. If you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything. Remember the lessons of the civil rights movement. And black people did not get the, the right to vote by voting. We got it by the, the ability to organize and mobilize in our own name. That's exactly what the working class has to do today to end this war. Make no mistake about it. There is no mystery to ending this war. But until such time as people make a commitment to get out their asses and do something, it's not going to be any change. So what are we fundamentally talking about today? What's the bottom line? You mean to tell me that we can't take off a day in order to shut this country down? We're not talking about you putting your life on the line. Remember, as I stand here as an African American, I can attest to you that we have been the victims of real terrorism. This is the time for you to stand up and to challenge all of which of that which is holding us back. We still live in a society where people in the South, it wasn't that very long ago, where they didn't even want to support Medicare because they didn't want the hospitals integrated. That's one of the fundamental problems we have in this country, around the division between the North and the South. There are no unions in the South. And there's a reason for that, because they want to continue to perpetuate white supremacy and divide the working class. Wake up. Stop the war abroad, in the war at home. Stop the war abroad, in the war at home. Stop the war abroad, in the war at home. Stop the war abroad, in the war at home.